afterwards. And so uh, the Rosetta Stone basically is the, the idea behind it was uh, the idea of factory is that know where ideas come from. Uh, be someone who takes advantage of these opportunities. There's different categories of ideas, but then to determine the difference between a viable business dream and a nightmare as quickly as possible. Uh, someone who is, in, who is trying to find a cure for AIDS or for some type of cancer. They go down these blind alleys. And after you go down a few blind alleys, uh, where you realize that is not the cure for whatever I'm trying to find the cure for, uh, you start learning that there's certain principles, certain things I can do so I don't have to go down that blind alley as far next in subsequent mm. times. And the same holds true with an idea. Then once a person takes it through the SWOT analysis, which is basically four letters, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, what I did with the Rosetta Stone project is I just said, okay, what are the strengths and what do I bring to this and what are the strengths of the idea itself? What are the weaknesses of this idea? And what are my weaknesses in terms of putting this together? And what are the opportunities, uh, good, bad, or indifferent? What, what are the opportunities that are out there for something like this and the unique, uniqueness of it? And what are the potential threats, the legal threats and otherwise? So I had to do all of that first before I invested one bit of money or uh, one, one bit of time toward this particular project. And uh, five years ago, just an idea ricocheting around, and now uh, we have some universities and museums that have picked up on it. I got some airports that are looking at it and uh, some other things I can't share right now, but uh, in another year or so, some pretty huge things around the Rosetta how Stone. Would this, how would this apply to an airport? Well, uh, they're looking for things to entertain and educate uh, huh. people who are stuck huh. uh, in airports. And yeah. so to have a, uh, by the way, the Rosetta Stone is 45 inches by 30 inches by 11 inches thick. And uh, we've just developed the base for it and to be able to put something that's museum quality in there, uh, put a nice rope around it, but then have some information about it. And you never know, some key decision make makers uh, travel all over the place and they might come and say, I want that. Huh. I want that for the foyer of our, of our bank or <laughs> our, our company. Because of its, its, its symbolic uh, importance. Yes, there's so many disciplines that attach themselves to it. Yeah. You have cryptology. Ne yeah. Next month yeah. I'm speaking at National Security Agency. Uh, uh, you have um, uh, the geology, the rock itself, an igneous rock, uh, very int much interest in why that particular rock was used. You have uh, linguistics, Rosetta mm. Stone language software company because of the translation that took place. Uh, th then, then there's uh, other aspects. So it's, it's kind of like a metaphor, if you will, for cracking some kind of conundrum, some code, mm -hmm. some problem. And so it could, it could be a metaphor for relational problems, uh, for how to crack the code for, during these tough economic times. And uh, so I just figured there's a lot of disciplines that attach themselves to it. So um, maybe if they don't understand it, I'll help them under educate them on how it, uh, how it uh, is attacked attached to their particular yeah. discipline. I found it interesting in your book when you talked about uh, the present day reality, which is not going away of the internet, and how you need to protect your ideas. Uh, and so you, you search the uh, internet every, I think you said in the book, two to three months yes. to make sure that someone else inadvertently, if not deliberately, hasn't uh, stolen your ideas. Well, I think that's all part of uh, branding. Uh, when you have developed a brand, it's important to protect it. And uh, branding, it's, it's a tough job coming up with something that's unique and stands alone and hasn't already been used somewhere. But I think it's important to, to patent it, uh, to trademark it, uh, whatever uh, people do in the particular country that they're watching this, to, to make sure that it's protected, and then spend the time. Uh, you know, I, I, for instance, that dealing with people who drive you crazy, there's a, a gentleman who um, wrote a book by that title. And uh, I found out about it, and I called the company, and I said, uh, I just want you to know I'm coming out with a book, and I know that you might want to protect your uh, what you're doing and uh, so uh, the book publishing company backed away from using that title and came up with another title but I happened to catch it early enough uh, in, the, in, the, in the stage of, of uh, marketing on their end in order for them to switch the cover title. It's a whole new culture that's emerged there with the internet. Now here's, now I don't know if we have, do we have a shot of this book, If Nobody Loves You Create the Demand workbook? Do we have a shot of the workbook? We do. There's, yeah, there's the workbook, Joel. Now. Uh, I read the, uh, this book. I didn't read this book. Tell me about the workbook. Uh, why, why have you done this, and uh, what's its value from your perspective? Because I see a lot of scripture in here, for one thing. 
First, the, the, the thing is that the book, uh, most of my work, you know, I worked as chaplain for the Bullets, the Wizards for 19 years, and, and I do have a, a bent toward the things uh, of, that are eternal. And um, the book was endorsed by folks like Les Brown, Steve Forbes, Ken Blanchard, Brian Tracy, Ben Carson, a host of people. That's for the general marketplace. And uh, the workbook, I began to think of, of kind of like the, the, the razor and the razor blade concept that this whole idea of branding could, could then be used in different ways. So uh, this is the first of several workbooks. This workbook is specific for, specifically for churches because as I surveyed the marketplace, there are CEO clubs, uh, there are networking clubs and churches and business clubs, but nothing specifically around entrepreneurship. So I thought, uh, you know, as a former senior pastor, that if I approached pastors and said, uh, how would you like to have a, a book workbook concept to develop an entrepreneur club in your church? So that as the entrepreneurs become more successful, then the domino effect is that they can then hopefully tithe or give more to your enterprise, to, the, to your organization. And then the another part of the domino effect is then you can do more, both locally and internationally. And uh, so that's, that's the whole design behind it. There's a leader's guide in there. Mm -hmm. And there's enough material with the book, workbook combination for a, uh, a local church to have enough material for about 10 months. And then I had the magazine. Yeah. Now here's, uh, here's, here's the magazine. It's called Everyday, Everyday Matters Magazine. Uh, tell me about that. The magazine is a different model. It's both timeless yet timely. And you can see there's uh, Ben Carson yeah. on the cover and then some of the articles. Uh, you have an article on raising kids without raising your voice, mm -hmm. uh, men and their emotions, mm -hmm. cyberbullying, and uh, online harassment, and then also taking care of aging parents. So I wanted to have something that an entrepreneur club could do as a, as a collective group because entrepreneurs typically have an attention span of about 13 seconds <laughs> if it's not uh, uh, something they're, they're particularly interested in. Yeah. So I wanted to have something where entrepreneurs can come together and then they can do a project because uh, there's enough ad space in there for them to sell ads to raise a little over $16,000. They can then print up in their local print shop for about $8,000, they can print up about 25,000 copies. And because it's timeless, yet timely, even if it takes 18, 24 months, advertisers love it. Because if you buy an ad in a magazine for the month of, of June, let's say, guess what happens on July 1st? Yeah. You gotta buy another ad, because that's yeah. going to the trash. And so this is timeless, and, and, and so if it takes 18, 24 months for the, the, the church group to distribute all these ads, or the, these uh, magazines, in their everyday lives, um, then the advertising, my advertising dollars are spent, well spent. But I had one, one person in our church said, she said, I went to the grocery store to share Jesus. And while I was there, I picked up a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. So it's just a paradigm shifter. This is designed for everyday conversations, non-weird conversations. Someone could be in McDonald's, some other restaurant yeah. or something like that. And they reach out, and here's a, here's a young mother with a child, and, and you, you hand them the, the magazine, and on the front cover it says, Raising Kids Without Raising Your Voice, and suddenly she says, I could have used that this morning. And guess what? You got a conversation started. Yeah. And you never know what's going to happen with that conversation, what direction it's going to go. Yeah. How many years since you pastored? Oh my goodness, let's see, that was uh, 1993 is when I retired, I did that for, nine, for 18 years, uh -huh. and uh, then decided to take my pastor's heart into the business world. Yeah. Now if you were to go back pastoring again, and I've got two minutes, with what you have learned and all that you have experienced with this uh, great entrepreneurial energy of yours, what would you do differently? I would, uh, first of all, I would be, uh, uh, I guess I, I would have gateways and a, a kind of a gateway of uh, entrepreneur clubs. I'd reach people in different ways. Uh, I love doing things coming in from the side door rather than coming straight at people. And to be able to, to find out what are the felt needs, uh, what are the issues, where is your pain, and, and how can we help with that, deal with that pain. And then to, uh, to be friends and to, to allow the friendship to, do, to, to, to uh, bring about uh, kind of a relationship where there's trust. And once the trust is built and earning the right to, to be heard, I think that provides an opening to, to share the good news. Hmm. What's the best um, email, or I should say a website? Uh, work hard, smart, work, work hard, work smart dot com? Would that be the best yeah, work way? Hard, work hard, work dot com, those four words. Yeah. Work hard, work hard, work hard, work smart dot com will take to the, to the book. Right. And then also the entrepreneur clubs will 
come from there and they can see all about other things. And one thing I'd love to do yeah. across Canada and anyone that's watching this, I'd love to do entrepreneur seminars as an outreach and I make myself available to do that because I think that's a unique way to reach out to the community and then maybe to help to establish an entrepreneur club in that community. Yeah. Well, this is uh, very interesting. It's a, certainly an approach that you don't uh, encounter every day, and I think it's so creative, typical of you, Joel. <laughs> and I uh, so appreciate you coming and sharing with us. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for My coming pleasure. our way.